Okay, uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, thank you very much for uh, joining uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Jingli's uh, uh, defense. And uh, uh, her, her dissertation con uh, title is a country theory framework for crypto economy. And uh, thank you very much for participating, all the committee member. And Jing, you can start now. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. And the title of my dissertation is Contract Theory Framework for Crypto Economics. And uh, here is the outline of my today's presentation. The first part is about the introduction of blockchain basics. So first of all, I would like to introduce the basic concept or basic definition of the uh, blockchain network. And according to the IBM network, uh, they describe the blockchain network is a decentralized, distributed, consensus-based, a digital ledger protected by the uh, cryptography from revision and then tampering over the P2P network. And uh, also here I list the three major types of uh, network model. So the first one shows the centralized network model. It only consists of one centralized party and controlling everything happened in the network. And the second one is a distributed network. And the last one is a decentralized network. And in general, we always consider the decentralized network is a subset of the distributed network. So we all say uh, we we always say the blockchain network is built upon the distributed network as well as the decentralized network. Just because um, the blockchain, especially the public blockchain network, is is stored in the distributed network and is operated in the decentralized way. So here is a uh, here is a basic architecture of the blockchain network. Even though we have several different types of blockchain uh, blockchain networks, uh, the longest chain is the uh, most uh, popular and the most uh, basic architecture of the blockchain network, which which was first proposed by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto in two thousand eight in his famous project called the uh, Bitcoin network. And uh, in each block, we can see. Uh, it, it can say several content inside. The first one would be the hash value of the block header and the hash value of the previous block header. And the followings would be the transaction data. All the transaction data uh, are organized into a tree-like data structure. And then in, a, in a Bitcoin project, the data structure is called um, a Merkle tree, a Merkle hash tree. So in other, in other types, blockchain network and maybe have some other uh, names. And all the blocks will be organized uh, into the longest chain. And these blocks will be uh, connected with each other in a sequential order. And um, here we should know that the blockchain, the blockchain is, not, um, uh, is not developed or it's not created by the Satoshi Nakamoto. So here is a brief origin of the blockchain network. So in back into 1980s, we can see the um, uh, uh, we can see the creator of Merkle tree. Uh, he called the Merkle draft first a proposed a data structure called the Merkle tree. And after that, in 1982, Leslie Lamport first formulated a problem called the Byzantine Generals problem. And this problem is the core problem of the blockchain network. And uh, after that, we can see in 1990s. Uh, there are a lot of uh, scholars and researchers working on the Byzantine generals problem as well as the uh, tree-like data structure. So in 1990, uh, 1991, Stuart Harbour worked out the idea that connect all the blocks into a chain data structure. And in 1997, uh, to deal with the Byzantine general problem, Adam Beck proposed a hash cache project and using the proof of work to resist such kind of uh, problem. And uh, based on that key components in 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto firstly proposed a project and uh, proposed the concept called the blockchain technology. So now we can consider, we can, uh, we can conclude uh, the key components of the blockchain network. It consists of um, four major components. Uh, they are including the cryptography, the chain data structure, and the consensus protocol, 
as well as the incentive mechanism. So uh, in the blockchain and in the blockchain area, we can see about two camps focusing on the different types of the technology components of blockchain network. The first camp is the computer science camp. They focus on the uh, hardcore technology and they consider the blockchain is a computer science uh, solution. So they only consider the cryptography, the data structure and um, the consensus protocol design. And in 2015, uh, some experts and scholars from the Ethereum Foundation figure out the incentive issue is also important to the blockchain network. And they, they consider the blockchain is a solution to the incentive problem. So they uh, formulate the second camp and then propose the issue called the crypto economics. And then in the crypto economics, they uh, formulate and extend the issue, the incentive issue in the blockchain network. So up to now, what's the differences between the crypto economics and uh, blockchain networks? It would be a little bit confusing. So first, all the blockchain network, all the blockchain projects on uh, all the other blockchain-based solutions will be considered as the instance of the crypto economics. So all the, all the blockchain projects are, uh, for, the, for, for the popular ones, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, for the consensus one, the proof of work, proof of stake, and the proof of authority. And uh, for the layer two, all the scalability issues, all the scalability solutions to the blockchain network, such as the seed channel, the plasma sharding, and uh, the rollup solutions would be also considered as the instance of the crypto economics. Uh, crypto economics. In 2015, the founder of uh, Ethereum called the last first proposed the definition about the crypto economics. And uh, he argued that the crypto economics is to use the incentive mechanism to secure a distributed, uh, a distributed network. So here we can see uh, two uh, key words. The first one is the incentive, second one is the security. So how can we use the incentive to achieve the security goal in a distributed network? And as we know, we already have the cryptography method. So what's the differences between, the, uh, between using the cryptography to achieve the security goal and using the incentive to achieve the security goal? So for the cryptography part, we always use the cryptography to develop some algorithm and protocol to resist some potential malicious attack. But for the incentive part, uh, with the assumption that the majority of the users uh, are the rational. So we'll design the optimal incentives to uh, motivate the rational participants. So that's the major differences between the two, uh, two ways to achieve the, the critical goals. So how does uh, the in, uh, economic incentive to secure a distributed system? Or, or in, in other way, how can we use the incentives to build up a security, uh, a secure and uh, distributed system. So the first one is the reward. Uh, the reward is used to increase some actors' token balance or account balance if they do something good. So the next one would be the penalty. The penalty is to reduce the, some actors' token balance if they do something bad. So in this figure, we can see there always exists a majority of the uh, rational or honest uh, actors and uh, as well as some other malicious attackers. But for the, for the system, they didn't know who is uh, honest, who is uh, rational and who is um, malicious. So uh, after the system initial, initialization station, stage, the honest one can start to uh, figure out which one would be the uh, malicious one. So after uh, send out the warnings to the system, the system can check if the warning is valid. So if the, uh, if the attack or attacker is valid, so all the, all the uh, rational users that send out the warnings would be, in, would be increasing their uh, balance and um, uh, slash the malicious attack account balance. So that's the way, that's the way we, how we use them reward and the penalty to secure the distributed system. And the last one is called a privilege. 
the privilege is often used in a POS based network because in the POS network, we don't have the uh, strong consensus protocol such as the uh, POW to help us uh, secure the whole, uh, whole digi uh, digital ledger. So we have to use the privilege to give the to give some the, to give the rational users uh, the decision making right. So with the voting weight, also we will call the voting weight can give the uh, users the decision decision making right. With the voting weight, the uh, honest one and the malicious one can make decision by their own. But after after the after the checking stage, the uh, malicious one may be figured out by the honest one. So after doing that, we can increase the reputation and uh, uh, reduce the reputation. So that's according to their uh, behaviors. So next question would be, how can we determine the best uh, outcome? How can we determine the optimal economic incentives? So the best way to determine the optimal uh, incentives would be, would be the mechanism design. The first uh, methodology is the auction theory. The auction theory has been widely used in the blockchain network scenario, such as the, the transaction fee pricing on the main chain. And the second way is the coalitional games. The coalitional games is, is, uh, can only be widely used in the mining pool because um, the games is only used for uh, analyzing the actions between the coalitional uh, scenario. And the last one is contract theory. However, the contract theory is not, it's not widely used in the blockchain scenario. And um, um, actually there's some overlap between the auction theory and the contract theory. But the difference is in that the auction theory can only have the auction year to pick up, to pick or to select the best buyer for the game. But the contract theory can benefit for a large group of users. So in this page, I'd like to introduce some basic concepts of the contract theory. So what is a contract theory? The contract theory is a subfield. It's a very important subfield of the game theory, or we also consider the contract theory is a subfield of the economics. It's a macroeconomics, and it's mainly used for dealing with the information asymmetry. So what is the information asymmetry? Suppose we have a market, and in that market, we have several parties involved in. And if there exists at least one party have more, more private information than the other parties, and the, all the information, all the private information cannot be known by all the other parties. So we can say, oh, there exists the informational symmetry in this market. So that means uh, in this figure, we can see uh, one party would be responsible for designing the game and all the, all the other party participants for the, this game. And there exists the private information between the two, between the two sides. And uh, the, all the private information of the private, of, of all the private information of the um, this side cannot be known by the game designer. So in this scenario, we call all, all the, the contrast theory of the information asymmetry has existed. And the contrast theory is developed to overcome the uh, to overcome the information asymmetry. So uh, under the contrast theory framework, we generally have three major models to deal with different kinds of information or actions. So the first one is called uh, the Oliver selection. The Oliver selection model is used for dealing with the hidden information. It's also in the same uh, scenario, we have two sides. The first one is uh, game designer and all and the other side consists of the uh, game design, uh, game participants. So the, all the private information of this side cannot be known by the game designer. So the game designer have to obtain some prior knowledge about the private information. He cannot know the specific knowledge about the uh, users, but he can have a rough knowledge, the prior knowledge about the distribution of the private information. And only according to the prior knowledge, the game designer will design a set of different types of contracts in that menu. And uh, for all the game participants, they will try to select the corresponding type of contract for, by their own. And the second type 
it's also for it's also for dealing with uh, hidden information. But the differences, uh, but the differences is that uh, in this case, the private information can be known by the, the other side. So the uh, the famous example would be the job marketing. In this market, uh, in this market, the game designer would be the manager, and the other side would be the interviews or the the job candidates. All the candidates want to get this position, and uh, during their interview, they will try to show the diploma or the uh, degree certificates to demonstrate that they have the ability to uh, uh, to get this position. So the process that showing their private information or to prove their information is called signaling process. And we should know that the process must be costly and cannot be forged because um, uh, such as the diploma, we uh, have the numbers or serial numbers or signatures on the diploma. So it's quite difficult to be forged. And uh, to take the diploma or the degree would be very cost because we have to first uh, uh, enroll in that enroll, enroll in that program. And then we have to take time, take money to complete that degree. So the whole process of reviewing, reviewing your information is called the signaling. And the second type is um, it's used for uh, dealing with the hidden actions. And this kind of issue always exists after signing the contract. So it is called the moral hazard. How can we use the moral hazard to deal with this uh, uh, hidden action? Uh, suppose in, in this kind of market, the candidates already joined the uh, company and uh, the candidates can have an outcome. And this outcome is highly related to their efforts. And the efforts will impact the outcome and outcome will impact the profits of the company. So from the manager's perspective, they would, like to, they would prefer a higher performance and higher outcome so that they can make more money on that outcome. So the best way to monitor, to regulate their behaviors after signing the contract is to make the, the payment is related to their performance. So through a regular, uh, through a regular monitoring, uh, monitoring uh, methods, they can uh, observe the actions of the different types of, uh, different types of the candidates and then pay for them just according to their performance. That means if they have a higher performance, they will pay more and a lower performance only get smaller <clears throat> payments. Okay, so this page I would like to introduce the motivation of my PhD study. So why I would like to use the contrast theory to deal with the essential issue of the crypto economics. So what's the problem? What's a major problem existing in the crypto economics? That is, they always in, exist the information asymmetry in crypto economics. So what is kind of the information asymmetry in the crypto economics? So in this figure, we can see all the, all the users in the, in the blockchain network or in the crypto economics context, users are anonymous. So first of all, also the most important, all the users are anonymous in the blockchain and the most of the users uh, we can assume that, that they are rational and they are not willing to reveal their private information. And the last one that the number of the participants is uh, quite large compared to the uh, small, uh, small, uh, small scale company. So the solution to this kind of problem would be the contrast theory because the contrast theory can always overcome the information asymmetry and can always benefit a large number of rational participants. So that's why I would like to use the contrast theory to start my uh, PhD study. So uh, first I figure out the contrast theory would be a possible and feasible solution to the crypto economics. And uh, in my following pages, I would, like to, uh, I would like to describe how can I use the models and the contrast theory framework to deal with the incentive issues uh, for the crypto economics. So in this figure, I first list the, the major models I have introduced in the previous pages. And here is the um, major incentive issues uh, consistent, in the, consistent in the crypto economics. So first the work, I would like to use the adverse selection model to deal with the penalty issue in the crypto economics contest. 
and the title would be the contract-based approach for the security deposit in blockchain network with Sharp. So first of all, I would like to introduce the background of this work. Um, in this work, uh, a very important concept is called sharding. The sharding is a very uh, important, it's a very important uh, concept or term for the scalability issue in the blockchain network. Um, in the blockchain, also in the next generation blockchain, the sharding is a promising solution to the scalability issue. And uh, this work is inspired by the Ethereum Foundation's uh, design. They proposed the Ethereum 2.0 using the beacon chain and the sharding chain architecture. In their paper, they're using the, uh, they're using the sharding chain to realize the scalability. And in the sharding chains, we can see that the shards is, um, the shards is generated by the different, type, different groups and all the subgroups is called committees. So in this paper, I will use a committee to denote the different uh, groups and use um, sharding to show the different blocks that, that is generated by the committees. And in this scenario, they propose a very important concept called the security deposit. Uh, unlike the proof of work, uh, proof of stake is difficult to derive the security. So they propose a security deposit in the proof of stake context to help us to derive the security, to, to help us to met metric the security. So in this, in this scenario, uh, they always use the um, size of the security deposit to metric the security in the proof of stake. And they uh, propose that everyone should submit 32 ether before they join the network. And they consider that the deposit must be exceeding the gains or rewards can provide a sufficient uh, security incentive in proof of stake network. But here is the problem that for the rich people, 32 ether may not be sufficient because they are really uh, rich and have a lot of money in their account. And uh, for, the, for the poorer one, they don't have enough money. So that means the opportunity to join the network because they cannot afford 32 ether. So that's the major motivation of this work. We would like to design a, a flexible security deposit for different types of validators. So all the validators can have opportunity to join the network. So here's the uh, system overview of the first work. First step, the uh, validators in the waiting pool have to submit a deposit to the main chain and to receive the deposit receipt from the main chain and to give the main, give the uh, give the receipt to the sharding chain uh, to the beacon chain and to obtain the confirmation and uh, after get confirmed all the validators will join in the uh, committees and are waiting for selected into different committees and after after joining the different committees they will be respons responsible for uh, generating different shardings and uh, the different shardings will be uh, uh, confirmed and uh, merged into, into the main chain. Uh, and all the transactions will be confirmed by the beacon chain before they join into the uh, main chain. So here is a contract model, just uh, based on that architecture we introduced. So the first step, all the, uh, all the leaders in the beacon chain, the temporary leaders in the beacon chain can be the game designer to help, us be, uh, to help us design the contract. And uh, based on the prior knowledge of the participants, the, uh, the game designer will design the different types of contracts for the validators. And the validators will select the corresponding contracts according to their own type of information. And uh, after signing the contract, the validator will submit the deposit according to the contract items. And then the beacon chain will issue the reward or charge the penalty on the validator according to their actions and the behaviors. So next we came to the system model part. First of all, we have to classify the validators into different types according to their state value. First of all, the system design, a game designer will try to classify the, uh, classify the validators into different types according to their prior knowledge. So here is the utility function for, 
for all the types of editors. So here we can see the utility function is consists of uh, three parts. The first one is used for evaluating the rewards that is obtained from the beacon chain. And the second one is used for evaluating the total computation cost. And the last one is used for evaluating the possible penalty for the current type validators. And uh, specific, uh, specifically, we can see the uh, evaluation function for the penalty is showing like this. And now we, uh, uh, we have to figure out two important principles under the game theory framework. That is um, individual rationality and uh, incentive compatibility. First, so what is the individual rationality? That means uh, the that means the contract or the game can always provide a, a positive utility for the users for the game participants. That means if the uh, that means if the user is rational, so he will always try to sign the contract because the contract can always offer a positive incentive compared to not signing the contract. So the second one is called the incentive compatibility. Compa uh, incentive compatibility means that uh, the users can only obtain and maximize the profit by choosing the right type information contract. Because um, uh, in the mathematical design, we can see the equation showing that if they want to try their own tab, they can, they can obtain the utility function like this one. But if they are, if they are trying to select the other tab uh, contract, they can only have a lower profit from that kind of contract. So the two major protocols or principles can guarantee the most of the rational users can accept the contract and can uh, select the corresponding tab contract. So next, uh, we will introduce the uh, beacon chain model. First of all, we have the utility function for the beacon chain. It is for the temporary leader, not, the, not, not for the really uh, beacon chain. And the first uh, term is showing like this. It, has, uh, it consists of three parts. And we use uh, the first part to evaluate the validator's time, the working time, and the uh, type information as well as the reward. And the second one is used to calculating the cost of rewarding different types of validators. And then we also have another constraint for the beacon chain utility function. So here we can see for the beacon chain, he can always have a positive incentive uh, compared to not signing, not, not, not designing such kind of contract. And then we start uh, with and a constraint, we have the problem formulation. First, it is a maximization problem, consists of two parts, and the following would be the constraint. And these constraints are derived from the utility function for the different types of validators. So first, we can see uh, these are IC and error constraints. The following would, uh, would be the monotonicity constraints. First of all, uh, if we want to work out the optimal solution for this kind of contract theory, so we must uh, to reduce the constraints first because uh, we have so many different types of validators and uh, each type have so many constraints uh, associated. So that's why we have to first uh, reduce the constraints. Only after reducing the constraints, we can use some other mathematical tool to obtain the, uh, obtain the optimal solution. First of all, it's a, uh, monotonicity condition. Uh, this condition refers that the validators with a lower working time will always gain a higher reward. So in the mathematical design, it's showing like this. Of the type I have a, have a short working time, that means he have a higher performance. The higher performance can obtain a higher reward from the system. And uh, based on the monotonicity condition, we can try to reduce the IR constraint. So that means if we can satisfy the IR constraint for the type one validator, so that means all the other, well, all the other as IR constraint for the other types can also be kept. And uh, using the monotonicity condition and uh, IC, uh, and uh, IC condition, we can reduce the IC constraint. Constraint reduction. So this means 
this means all the validators can uh, can using this can using this reduction to reduce their IC constraints uh, because uh, uh, according to the mathematical design. So the uh, validators can only obtain the maximize the profit by selecting the corresponding uh, type of contracts. So the mathematical design showing that the uh, type I validator can have, uh, can have the maximize the profit than all the other ones. Here we can see all the type, uh, type items refer to the um, type J, not, the, not all the, uh, can refer to the type J. So in the mathematical data, there, there will be a lot of, uh, there will be a lot of um, inequality. So this reduction refers to that we only have three uh, constraints for each tab. The, they will not be the uh, tab J, they will be the tab I plus one and the tab I uh, minus one. So all the other, all the other tabs uh, constraints can be reduced to the neighboring constraints. So after reducing all the constraints, we can have to we can come to the optimization problem part. And this part it will be very easily to uh, to work out using just using the MATLAB tool. So just based on the reduce the constraint, the uh, IR constraint and SF constraint. So we can see the constraints not be the not not be the inequality inequality ones. All all the constraints can be the equalities. So based on the equalities, we can derive the expression with respect to the reward R and using the R with some variables and we substitute into the optimization problem. And then we can work out the closer, formula, closer solution to this optimization problem. So here's the simulation part for this first work. In this figure, we can see the feasible of the, the feasibility of the contrast theory. So here we can see only uh, choosing the corresponding corresponding contract, the users or the validators can obtain the maximum the profit. And the second one, it shows the it shows that the feasibility of the contract theory in designing the different types of deposits. So we can see that the higher type validator will always have a higher reward, but he must uh, submit a greater the created deposit to the to the system, but for the lower one, they only need to submit a smaller uh, secreted deposit to the secret uh, to the system. And in this page, I will show, I would like to show the uh, secreting incentive. That is a metric to uh, evaluate to evaluate the security feature of the POS network. So after calculating the secreting incentive, we can we can demonstrate that all the security size in this work. Uh, has not been has not been reduced or impact at all. It can be greater or equal to the original one. So the, uh, here is a summary of the first work. That is, um, first one I would like to I have used the contract theory to determine the flexible security deposit, and by using the security deposit, we can demonstrate that the, the economic incentive is not uh, can uh, can be increased and. Uh, uh, we, we didn't reduce the, the secreting incentive. So also in this figure, we use uh, the word selection to realize the uh, penalty incentive under the crypto economics framework. So next work, I would like to use, um, I would like to use a, a combined model under, under the contract, contract theory and to combine another game theory called the Stackover game and to uh, deal with another issue called the online reward. And the title is called Cyber Insurance Design for Validator Rotation in Sharded Blockchain Networks, a hierarchical game-based approach. So in this work, uh, first I would like to introduce the background. It is called a discouragement attack. This kind of attack is more like a, it's more like a potential attack or uh, it's more like a consequence of some other kind of attack, such as the censorship attack. So the working process of the attack is showing like this. Uh, when uh, in the POS network, when the validators would like to trying to uh, trying to send the message to the others, the malicious attacker will now try to send the message to all the 
to the uh, to some of the honest one. So um, this one showing like um uh, showing like a message. So we here we can see the message showing some some signatures on that, but we don't have some other uh, honest signatures from the honest validators. So um, after doing that, some honest validator will drop off the network because they didn't see any they didn't see any message in the in the network. So don't want to try they don't want to send the uh, message to the validators. <clears throat> so in the second stage, the attackers will try to uh, try to send the message only within the attackers, not try to send them into the honest validators. So then in the second stage, uh, the other honest validators will drop the drop off the system. So eventually in the sharding in the community, um, there will not exist any honest validators inside. So after doing that, eventually the um, malicious attackers can initial double spending or something like you know, something uh, something like that. Other malicious attacks to uh, to initial some more more uh, uh, more serious attacks such as the double spending and to control all the whole all the whole systems. So here is the conventional reward distribution uh, regarding the POS network. Uh, R is a total reward in the system, and N is a total signature in the it's a total number of the participants. So after doing that, the malicious one can obtain all the to all the reward from the system. So after after a figure out figure out in that kind of potential attack, the Vitalik's uh, upgrade the reward distribution by a new equation it's called um, uh, upgraded reward distribution and use a new equation uh, the equation is uh, n divided into r multiply n divided into m uh, there is a new parameter is m m is a, a number of the signature seen in the message so the working process of this kind of attack is that to reduce the signature in the message try to discourage the honest validator or the rational validator to drop off to to drop off the drop off the system so the key point here is um, the fewer validators seen sign the signature uh, sign the message then the lower everyone's reward but after doing this we cannot resist the such kind of attack so but uh, Vitalik explore um, a new method called um, visual delay so he argued that if we want to if we want to resist this kind of attack, not only the this discouragement attack, maybe the censorship attack, we have to we have to set up a withdrawal delay for all the validators before they uh, before they exit the system, so that we can have time for the system to check if there occurs some some potential attacks for, uh, in this system. But here comes up with a problem that. Uh, what is the what is the best withdrawal delay? So how to resist such kind of uh, attack and how to neutralize the attack? How to neutralize the risk that is caused by the attack? So that is a major motivation of this work. First, uh, we would like to use the cyber insurance framework to uh, resist the, the discouragement attack, and then we would like to use the combined game theory model to determine the best uh, to determine the optimal withdrawal delay. So uh, here is a, a here is a system of overview. The first step, the main chain is recruiting all the validators, and the validators will try to in, uh, interact with the main chain and the sharding chain and waking into the communities. And then the malicious will uh, blend into the other honest validators, and the validator on the beacon chain will be a temporary leader. For respond, uh, to, to be responsible for designing the contract. And then the block manager will try to sign the insurance contract with the with the with the contract with the insurance uh, with the insurance company. And then at last uh, the cyber insurer will pay for the claim for the victims and if there exists a uh, discouragement attack. So here is a system model. <clears throat> First of all, based on the Based on the reward distribution we introduced in the previous page, uh, we first have the reward distribution and the expected loss. 
now we can calculate the expected loss function based on the distributed distribute uh based on the reward distribution function and uh, with the with the expected loss function now we can have the utility model for the cyber insurer the cyber insurance utility model will be quite simple and straightforward it consists of two parts the first one is a premium and the second one is a claim okay so that's the part that we introduced the blockchain utility model because the utility model is um it consists of the two parts uh, we use a combined game theory model to formulate this kind of uh, problem so the first one the first one is um gains from the validators activities and delays and the third part is a compensatory premium that he that is paid for the cyber insurer and the last one is a compensatory claim for the validators in this utility function we can see the blockchain is considered as an um, intermediary between the cyber insurer and the validators. He will pay for the premium for the cyber insurance and also add some and also add some compensatory claim for the validators. And next I would like to introduce the validator utility model. And first of all, it also will be also the type classification. And in this work, we use a trunked normal distribution to model the historical activities activities of the of the users uh, would be referred to AI. And a different type of AI would be referred to the um, big AI that's showing in this equation, just uh, using the trunked normal distribution to calculate different type validators. So based on that different type users, we will have that kind of uh, uh, benchmark that is no contract case. In this case, the users can have the opportunity to um, drop off the contract. They don't want to sign any, they don't want to try to sign any insurance contract. So, so we can see, um, so we can see the users have to have to buy all the loss the cost by the attack. And then here we come to the case that have the have the uh, uh, now we can uh, we, we we can come to the case that we, the utility with the contract. So with the contract part, we have still have two cases. The first one is a with single contract. That means we provide another opportunity that the uh, the validators have the opportunity to sign the insurance contract directly with the cyber insurer. So it's showing in this equation, and then with the mixed contract means that. You, uh, the validators have to sign the contract with the uh, with a blockchain, not directly with the cyber insurer. So here is the profit showing in this equation. Now we have the final utility function based on that two cases. And the first part is the differences between the two cases. And the third, uh, second one is the benefit from the historical activities. And third one, it is the cost function for the efforts and the last one would be the capital lockup cost. Uh, the last one means that because we have to we have to submit some um, some money that is locked into the uh, into the blockchain network or into the uh, contract. So that means the money is always falling in the value. So I would like to use uh, this kind of function to uh, evaluate to evaluating the capital lockup cost. And then we came to the problem formulation. The first one is for the uh, maximization problem for the cyber insurer. And the next, uh, next one would be the maximization problem for the blockchain. And then following would be the constraint for the validator's utility. So here uh, in this figure, the first utility, the first uh, maximization problem is, is in the stage one for the cyber insurer. It is formulated by the stackable game. It is a stage one for a st stage one game, and for the stage two, it is a um, beacon chain utility function. It is also the maximization problem for the contract theory, and then the, the green ones would be the constraint for the validators. It's also the stage two contract theory game, and then came to the uh, solution part. For the, for the solution part, first we have to assume all the solutions in the stage one have been 
have been, have been obtained. So by doing this, we can first uh, have the optimal solution in stage two. And in stage two, after, uh, after, after getting the uh, closer solution, we can still find the uh, random variables inside. So with that variables, we will substitute the, the solutions into stage one. Then with the backward induction, finally we can obtain all the closer solutions to the, this mathematical uh, problem. So here we can see the right one is for the uh, stage, stage two. It is for the, it is the optimal solution for the contrast theory. And the green one would be the closed form solution for the stage one, it is for the Stackelberg uh, game solutions. Here, the simulation and analysis, analysis part of this work. First of all, we can see the differences between the, uh, between the mixed contract case and the single contract case. So here we can see that the mixed contract can always lower down, can always have a lower premium for the validators. That means the validators don't need to submit a, a higher amount of premium to the contract. And the second, and the second page, second figure shows that the mixed contract can always provide a higher compensation claim for the validators because um, here we can see the differences between the two curves that the loss is always lower. The loss curve is always lower than the uh, single contract case. And the last one shows the feasibility of the mixed uh, of the combined model that is the um, feasibility of the contract and the stack of board game. So here we can see only the, only the validators selecting the corresponding contract can get the maximized uh, uh, profit from the, from the insurance. So here's the summary of my second work. First, uh, I use, um, I use uh, uh, two different reward di distribution to analyze the uh, impact of the discouragement attack model and then use a cyber insurance framework to analyze uh, interactions uh, among the three different parties and to use this kind of insurance to neutralize the cyber risk that is caused by the potential attacks. And then use a contrast theory to determine the, the, the optimal withdrawal delay for, for all different types of the validators. So here, the, oh, here is the last part of my work is um, about the conclusion and my future work. Uh, all my peers' study uh, consists of the two categories of the economics incentive uh, in crypto economics. And the first one is about the penalty. First one, I, I use a contrast theory model to determine the best penalty for different types of users. So in this figure, we can see uh, this, this work, I only use a reverse selection to overcome the private information that is account balances and then to uh, design a, a, a contract menu for different type of validators. In that menu, I provide a different type uh, contracts. And then um, by introducing two important principles and the game theory model. So uh, due, into, uh, due to the IR constraint, so most of the validators will try to accept the contracts. And due to the incentive compatibility uh, principle, the uh, users will only pick up the uh, will only pick up the corresponding uh, uh, will only pick up the corresponding contract for them. Okay, so here is the next um, work. It's about the online reward. We use a cyber insurance framework to neutralize the online risk that is caused by some potential attack, and use um, a hierarchical game, game model to resist uh, this kind of attack and to determine the. Uh, determine the online reward and the best withdrawal delay. So this work I uh, use a combined model and uh, the contract theory and uh, uh, with another game theory called a stack of game to overcome the uh, symmetric information that is called uh, the historical activities and um, design a, a, a insurance menu that in this menu also contains different types of menu items and uh, based on that two principles, because, uh, because of the IR constraint, most of them will receive that kind of insurance menu. And uh, due to SC constraint, most of them will try to pick up only the corresponding contract to maximize their profit. 
So again, with that menu, with, with that figure, we, we can figure out the other applications of the contrast theory in, in the other categories of the crypto economics. The first one is a signaling model we have introduced in the previous pages. It is also can use for dealing with the hidden, action, hidden information in the crypto economics. And the other one is about the random contract because all the three major models we have talked about, it all belong to the deterministic contract because all the atoms will be the deterministic. And the random contract means that uh, at least one of the atoms will be the random variables. So that would be uh, that is another very important branches of the crypto of, of the contract theory, and for the incentive part, the privilege is and uh, it's not discussed yet. So the right one would be the future work and that would be the future direction of my research. The first one is try to using the uh, signaling model to assign the voting weight. First one I would like to use the um, uh, signaling model and uh, some other contest theories to determine the voting weight for different types of users and try to use them, um, uh, try to use such kind of combined model to, uh, to incentivize the validators to upgrade, to invest on their device performance so that we can realize the vertical scaling for the, for the blockchain network. And the uh, second future work would be using the random contract to determine the transaction fee of the side chain. We have discussed that uh, the auction theory is widely used uh, in the transaction fee pricing on the main chain, but there are less the research work regarding the transaction fee of uh, transaction fee pricing of the side chain. So in this future work, I would like to use the combined model and uh, the uh, under the uh, under the random contract model and combine with the geometrical brown motion to determine the uh, dynamics of the transaction fee on the side chain. And I try to use a random contract model to maximize the side chain profit using that kind of uh, upgraded mathematical design. And the last one would be the crypto asset value stabilization. This work is mainly inspired by the, the uh, stable coin. And we try to use the insurance framework by using the contract theory option pricing model and um, to use um, some other uh, uh, risk evaluation methods, such as the uh, risk parameters auctions and, uh, the, and some other applications in the blockchain network, such as the smart contract to offer the insurance contracts to the crypto asset owners to make sure that their crypto asset value will not drop below the reserve price uh, within a required time slot. And here's all my previous publications during my PhD study. And that's all, thank you. Any questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. And uh, any questions from the committee? Um, thank oh. you very much, Jing.